afternoon. We're going to go ahead and start right on the dot at 1515. My name is Stacy Stender. I work for an NGO called JAPIGO, and I'm the chair of the Coordinating Committee of Scientific Activities organizing the conference. And my co-chair? Hi, I'm Megan Murray. Uh, I'm at, the, um, at Harvard University, and uh, I'm interested in um, comorbidities, so I'm extremely happy to be chairing this session. Great, so we're gonna start off with our first presentation by Michelle Pearson, if you could come on up. I assume it's pretty straightforward. Ah, there we go, it's loaded up. Okay. Michelle, can we ask you and, and other presenters just to identify uh, your institution and... Um, uh, thank you. Eight, eight to 10 minutes. We will be okay. very strict. Af uh, good afternoon, good. I'm uh, Michelle Pearson. I'm a medical epidemiologist at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. Today I'm going to briefly describe uh, an analysis that we undertook to examine the trends in hospitalization and the associated healthcare cost among TB hospitalizations in the United States. In the United States and indeed globally, there's a burgeoning uh, diabetes epidemic. In the United States alone, there are an estimated 22 million persons who are living with diabetes. Diabetes has been associated with a threefold higher risk of TB and poorer TB outcomes. In the 22 high burden countries, there's an estimated 7.5% of the TB burden has been attributable to, to diabetes. Many TB experts predict that diabetes will be the next condition to impact our global TB control efforts, and that's including in low incidence countries where uh, TB control efforts have been largely successful. The WHO Collaborative Framework for Care and Control of TB of Diabetes has identified determining hospitalization rates and excess medical costs associated with diabetes among TB patients as a priority research question. We had two objectives. One was to describe temporal trends in TB hospitalizations and in those uh, that with comorbid diabetes. And secondly, we sought to describe and compare outcomes and healthcare utilization among hospitalized TB patients with and without diabetes. To adjust these objectives, we used the National Inpatient Sample uh, Database, the NI or NIS database. The NIS is a component of the U.S.'s um, Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, or HCUP. Uh, the NIS retains all payer data on hospital inpatient stays at the, in the HCUP states, and those states represent more than 95% of the U.S. population. This database includes all patients, irrespective of payer status, and including the uninsured. The NIS sample approximates a 20% sample of U.S. community hospitals. Our study population included all hospitalizations with a primary diagnosis of tuberculosis. Both tuberculosis and diabetes were defined using standard, standard ICD-9 codes. We ascertained these hospitalizations for a 12-year period, uh, 2000 to 2011. We first examined secular trends in primary TB hospitalizations with um, and without diabetes and to examine um, the potential health and e economic impact associated with these hospitalizations, we looked at three outcomes. All-cause inpatient mortality, hospital length of stay, and inpatient charges. And these charges were adjusted to 2011 U.S. dollars. And lastly, we conducted a multivariable analysis to assess the independent predictors of inpatient mortality. Uh, during the 12-year uh, study period, we identified uh, just over 102,000 primary TB hospitalizations. Uh, 16,796, or 16% of those, had comorbid diabetes. The vast majority of these, 92%, were related to type 2 diabetes. This slide just shows the characteristics of the TB patients with and without diabetes in the NIS sample. As you can see that the sex distribution was fairly equal upon the two groups. 
those without diabetes. I mean, with diabetes tended to be older uh, than those with diabetes, uh, 45 years of age or older. Um, those um, without diabetes also attended, tended to be, uh, have a high representation from Hispanics and uh, Asian um, Pacific Islanders, which is not necessarily surprising in the U.S. Those are two groups that have both high TB rates and high prevalence of TB. We also looked at a number of other uh, comorbidities, and this distribution shows the relative prevalence of HIV, uh, tobacco dependency, history of tobacco use, COPD cancer, drug dependency, chronic kidney disease, and mental illness. This slide uh, shows, when we looked at the secular trends, this slide shows the uh, temporal um, trends in primary TB hospitalization rates in the U.S. And what you can see is that there has been a steep decline over the 12-year period. And this climb represents a 50% decrease in primary TB hospitalizations using the denominator of all, uh, all cause hospitalizations. And this decline was uh, statistically significant. By contrast, if we look at the subset of TB hospitalizations where there was comorbid diabetes, we see that there was a, a fairly dramatic increase and this increase was roughly 30% uh, over the 12-year period. Again, um, this increase was highly statistically significant. Um, this uh, graph shows the, um, um, the relative hospitalizations rates stratified by diabetes type. Um, in orange, you see the rates of TB hospitalizations for those with type 2 diabetes. And in blue, those TB hospitalizations with type 1 diabetes. Importantly, if you superimpose uh, the graphs for the types of diabetes um, in red and, and blue, uh, type, with type 2 diabetes, um, um, uh, the, uh, you will see that there's great concordance between the overall TB rate uh, with, uh, with diabetes along with that, tracking very closely with that due to type 2 diabetes. So this suggests that the increase that we're seeing in the uh, hospitalization rate for TB diabetes is largely being driven by comorbid type 2 diabetes. Next, we um, looked at uh, average length of stay um, among uh, these primary TB hospitalizations. And what you can see is that the length of stay ranged from uh, just over 14 days for TB patients without diabetes up to almost uh, 19 days for those who had diabetes that was uncontrolled. When comparing the uh, base case of TB without diabetes, those uh, patients who had any, any diabetes had a st statistically significant longer length of stay uh, at 15. And, important, and interestingly, those among those with diabetes, it was only those who had uncontrolled diabetes that had a statistically significantly higher length of stay at 18.7 days. Uh, next, we look at uh, average inpatient charges. Again, uh, the average inpatient charges ranged from a low of around 61,000 per admission among those uh, TB patients who lacked diabetes up to 89,000 for those with type 1 diabetes. I will note, and if you will recall, the the prevalence of type 1 diabetes in our sample was relatively small, and so the point estimates are not as stable, and you can see the confidence limits are quite wide. But again, we noticed that the group that had a statistically higher average inpatient length of stay uh, compared to TB patients without diabetes were those who had uncontrolled uh, diabetes mellitus, and that average uh, inpatient charge was 83,000 per admission. Um, and then we um, examined uh, inpatient mortality, uh, and, and the uh, over, t over time, um, uh, mortality remained uh, relatively stable, 
and it was uh, quite similar across all of these uh, combinations of uh, uh, TB with and uh, without diabetes. There was no statistically significant difference in the uh, occurrence of, of death based on uh, diabetes status. And lastly, um, we develop um, some regression models to look at some independent predictors of mortality among this cohort. Uh, we initially did a bivariate uh, analysis, and those things that were found to be significant were entered into a model. And after controlling for sex, race, income, payer status, the comorbidities I mentioned earlier, hospital characteristics and region, these were the factors that remained associated with patient mortality. Those of younger age, uh, that is less than um, 65, had a significantly lower uh, odds of death. Uh, those who had tobacco dependency had a significantly lower odds of death. And although uh, diabetes um, overall was a not associated with um, inpatient mortality, when we looked at the uh, uh, those who had evidence of controlled diabetes, we showed a protective effect against inpatient mortality. There are obviously some notable limitations to our uh, analysis, um, and primarily that's due to the use of an administrative database. Uh, administrative databases may be subject to coding errors. Um, this particular analysis was limited to hospitalizations where TB was listed as, as the primary diagnosis. So we may have um, not captured the full spectrum of either outcomes or uh, economic impact associated with all, uh, TB, all hospitalizations where TB is listed as any diagnosis. And again, because this is an administrative database, we weren't able to get detailed information on certain risk factors or certain details of the clinical, uh, uh, details of the clinical TB treatment or TB response or specific diagnostic tests such as uh, smear microscopy or chest x-ray. Yeah. Yeah. So in summary, um, we used a, a national sample to quantify TB hospitalization rates with and without coexistent diabetes. We found a significant increase in TB hospitalizations with diabetes over the 12-year period. This increase is due primarily to type 2 diabetes, and by 2011, one in five patients with primary TB hospitalizations had coexisting diabetes. Presence of diabetes was associated with longer length of stay and higher cost, but we did not find an association between diabetes and an increase of all-cause mortality. Our data did suggest, however, that good, maintaining good glycemic control may reduce the risk of inpatient mortality as well as lower health care cost among patients, TB patients who are admitted with diabetes. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, particularly Catherine Rapol, and conclude by uh, thanking you for your attention. So next, we are um, uh, welcoming Shanho Lin, who's going to uh, talk to us about chronic kidney disease, uh, progression, and TB cohort study. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to present our finding about the chronic kidney disease pro progression and risk of TB uh, based on a cohort study from Taiwan. I'm the presenter, Shanho Lin, from National Taiwan University. I'm, I'm presenting for Paul Cho. So I uh, just want to acknowledge Paul, uh, who was an MPH student from UC Berkeley, who did all the analysis, so the credits should go to him. And also, I want to acknowledge our collaborator, James Johnston, who did uh, uh, two seminal uh, important reviews regarding the risk of CK, uh, uh, the association between CKD and TB. And in fact, this present analysis was inspired by a poster by uh, James Johnston in the Union Conference two years ago. So uh, the population of uh, people on renal dialysis is uh, known uh, to be at risk of TB disease. But in fact, in terms of the quality of evidence, uh, the recent systematic review by James Johnson's group found that uh, the, the, uh, the number of high quality studies are actually uh, quite limited. So uh, the, the number of studies with uh, well-adjusted relative risk is actually only three 
but uh, they all found an increased risk of uh, uh, active TB disease, and the pooled uh, uh, relative risk is about three. But uh, this is just, uh, the, the dialysis ju is just a very small uh, proportion in terms of the full spectrum of the chronic kidney disease. So if you consider the full spectrum of chronic kidney disease, the recent review suggested that the global prevalence of CKD is about 8 to 16 percent. And in the Taiwan, where the study was conducted, an uh, 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 analysis involving half a million population suggested that the prevalence of CKD was 12 percent. And as you can see, that the majority of the burden of CKD was actually focused on the earlier stages of CKD rather than the uh, stage 5 or end stage renal disease. So what do we know about the risk of TB in the pre-dialysis um, population? The recent systematic review suggested that there was no any previous study about the risk of TB among pre-dialysis population. So uh, we can uh, briefly uh, hypothesize there might be two kind of relation between chronic kidney disease progression and TB. You can see from the left hand side is one possible scenario where only the late stage, the stage five disease is associated with uh, risk of TB, but the earlier stages of CKD was not associated. On the other hand, there might be, it's also possible that the earlier stage of CKD might be associated with risk of TB. So with that, we aim to uh, study the impact of the full spectrum of CKD staging on the risk of TB using a cohort study from Taiwan. So we used a uh, population-based cohort from a screening cohort in northern Taiwan, New Taipei City. So it's an integrated health screening service from 2005 and 2008. So everyone in the cohort was uh, received questionnaire, blood tests, and physical examination. And the data was cross-matched to the TB registry of Taiwan CDC to confirm the occurrence of incidence TB. So after excluding those with missing covariate and previous TB, we were able to include around 94,000 uh, population in the baseline, and we followed them up for around seven to eight years. And after that, about uh, almost 600 patient cases of TB occurred during the follow-up. And we used the uh, CKD epi formula to estimate the estimated uh, global rural filtration rate based on age, sex, and uh, serum creatinine. And we used the urine dipstick to define whether there's a, there was a presence of proteinuria in the baseline. And using this two information, we classify the patients uh, by different stages of CKD. And in our analysis, we adjusted for age, sex, body mass index, diabetes, smoking, alcohol, education, and beetle nut use as a proxy measurement of socioeconomic status. For diabetes manitus, we adjusted for that uh, by uh, uh, not just the dichotomous uh, diabetes, but also uh, the glycemic control using the fasting plasma glucose, because recently we found that the level of glycemic control is a very important predictor of TB disease. So this is the result. Um, we, in our population, again, the uh, uh, the majority of the CKD, as you can see, is concentrated on stage one to stage three. Only a very small proportion are stage four and stage five. And after multivariate age and multivariable adjusted, uh, first of all, you can see that the stage five disease has about threefold increase in the risk of TB. So this is consistent with the previous meta-analysis. And those with stage one and two, the adjusted hazard ratio was about 1.16, but the confidence interval was overlap with one. And for stage three disease, the adjusted uh, hazard ratio was 1.26 and just barely crossed one. But for stage four disease, the confidence interval was wide because uh, we only have seven uh, cases of TB. So this is one way to look at the uh, dose response uh, association. But uh, this method is uh, limited by assuming the constant um, risk within the category. So the other way to look at that the dose response is to look at the continuum. So we did a penalized by regression. Uh, so here the x-axis is the uh, estimated global rule of filtration, and the y-axis is the hazard of uh, TB disease. So you can see that uh, this three-shaded region is, corresponds to the different stages of CKD, and it seems that 
uh, starting from the stage three uh, CKD, the risk of TB started to increase gradually and then higher in stage four and then in stage five. So this uh, corresponds to the limited but uh, uh, current evidence about the current understanding in terms of the risk, the uh, immunodeficiency among CKD patients, which suggested that the immunodeficiency started as early as the stage of uh, stage three of CKD. So what does that mean in terms of the uh, impact of CKD on the burden of TB? So if we, we look again, the, uh, the majority of CKD uh, cases, they're coming from the stage one to stage three, but the hazard, uh, although they might impose a, a small uh, uh, hazard ratio, had increased risk, but the overall burden in terms of population attributable fraction might be high compared to the stage five disease. So if we just look at the point estimate of our analysis, if we only include the stage five disease and the, uh, the prevalence and the hazard ratio, the, the population attributable fraction for stage five CKD to the overall TB burden was only 0.2%. But if we include stage three to stage five disease, then the population attributable fraction increased to 1.7%. Assuming the, all the uh, hazard ratio is, is is causal and correct. The stage five, stage one to five CKD contributed to more than 3% of TB burden. So just uh, some uh, limitations of our study. We use one single um, time point measurement to classify CKD. So it's possible that during the follow-up period, those baseline with lower stages of CKD, they might progress during the follow-up period. And it's an observational study, so we cannot rule out the possibility of a measured or residual confounding. For example, we do not have information on immunosuppressants use, and we might uh, still suffer from some residual confounding by SES. So just to summarize, uh, in this, uh, we think it's first uh, study that looks at the pre-dialysis CKD and TB. We found some evidence of increased risk of TB in CKD stages before the end stage renal disease. And it seems that the risk of TB increases as the EGFR decreases starting from the, uh, the level of 60. And if the observation in our study is causal, then we'll see that there is a larger population attributable fraction from the pre-dialysis CKD than the uh, contribution from the end-stage renal disease. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. Um, so I was just wondering, I realize this isn't the, like the aim of your study, but did you try and estimate what proportion of the direct and indirect effect of uh, diabetes had with, in, in terms of CKD on the causal pathway? That, that's an excellent question. We did try to look at the effect modification, so whether the uh, association was affected by the presence of diabetes, and we did not find evidence of effect modification. We're also thinking about the uh, sort of the mediation analysis, the right indirect, but it's still uh, uh, under uh, uh, investigation. But thank Do you. Do you know what proportion of the CKD cases had diabetes? Uh, I don't have the number of the top of my head, but I can give you, I have it in my laptop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent report. I just had one question regarding to the uh, uh, great, um, drastically increased risk of TB in terms of stage five CKD. Could it be just uh, severely uh, impaired immune or just because these group of patients, they will visit hospital or chemodialysis or dialysis clinic a lot, so they greatly increase their exposure to TB. So do you have anything to comment? Thank you. Thank you. This, these, uh, this is a very good question and in fact, uh, so far, we do not have a very good understanding in terms of why the, the risk in a, uh, stage five is so high. And the, the two reasons you mentioned have both been su uh, uh, suggested, but I don't think there's any good uh, analysis that can separate out the, the two. But I, th I think in brief, these two are both possible and maybe both are contributing to the high risk. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I want to welcome uh, Francis Mimbira, who's going to talk to us about the prevalence of respiratory viruses among TB patients. 
Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I'll be presenting the, uh, this is part of my PhD, looking at uh, TB and co-infections, uh, HIV, helminth, and uh, respiratory viruses. But for the purpose of this uh, talk, I'll only talk about respiratory viruses. And uh, uh, I would like, right from the word go, thank my other co-authors and especially my supervisors, uh, Professor Sebastian and uh, Lucas Fenner from Swiss TPH. So I have uh, now any conflict of interest to declare. And uh, I'd like to bring, uh, bring on the old story of uh, respiratory viruses and TB. So back in 1919, actually, this is the, this is the uh, part of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the text that I took from uh, the California State Journal of Medicine, actually, uh, talking about if there are any increased number of beds in sanitarium, because most of the people who got uh, influenza ended up getting TB. And uh, this is where, by then, the management of TB was done. And uh, so a bit of a background is uh, it seems that respiratory viruses affect the Th1 immunity against TB. And this is very uh, evident for the pneumotropic influenza viruses that, of course, not only they act alone, but possibly in conjunction with other risk factors might actually uh, change the risk of somebody getting a TB. So, I would like to also present the experimental design that actually looks at what happens if you expose the mice to, to, to influenza virus. So for pra pragmatic sake, I use this enormous spray can to explain this, is there are two groups. So uh, the first group of mice were, were exposed to influenza virus, and the other one was only uh, given the phosphate buffered saline. And 28 days later, all these mice were given um, M tuberculosis spray. And uh, this paper came out in 2013. And actually, what they looked at is what is the bacterial load, but also what's the level of inflammation. And it seems that uh, the mice that were exposed to MTB had a higher viable bacterial load, but also at the same time, the lung inflammation was more. Uh, for mice that were exposed to, 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 to influenza virus. But similarly, if you look at the, the mortality, the, the survival was much, much less for the influenza-exposed mice. But in, uh, in humans, it, it's mostly demonstrable in mortality. And I'm just uh, showing you two reports from South Africa that actually there was excess mortality among individuals who had influenza at the, at the same time, they had deaths. Uh, so in our project, uh, our objective was to look at the prevalence of respiratory viruses among TB patients and controls, but also to look at what are the clinical phenotypes of TB patients who are also having uh, respiratory viruses. Uh, the setting is in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Dar es Salaam is the uh, it's, it's a city with a population of around 4 million. It's a high TB burden setting. And almost 25% of the TB cases notified in the country come in Dar es Salaam. And if you might see, Dar es Salaam, it's quite a small region, but there's a quite a high burden of, of TB. And uh, my, my PhD project is housed in a, in a big cohort of uh, TB patients and controls who are recruited and followed up for 12 months. So at recruitment at five months and 12 months, mostly of the work done is at recruitment where we took a lot of samples to try to establish the comorbidities, uh, specifically HIV, helminth, and also uh, respiratory viruses, but also respiratory uh, bacteria. I'll be presenting only the, the, the results from the recruitment stage, whereby we took the nasopharyngeal swabs and then we did, um, uh, we, we, we analyzed with Aniplex uh, RV16 detection. This is a, a kit from Sijin company from South Korea. And with this kit, there's uh, two panels, panel, panel A and B, and you, you can actually detect uh, 16 viruses at the same time. So this is a multiplex uh, PCR tool. So in terms of results, we, uh, this analysis involves 489 TB patients and 305 controls. The median age was about 35. 
uh, about 68% were males, and the HIV prevalence, of course, was high in TB patients of about 28.6%. For, for, for controls, it, it was 9.2%. And the overall prevalence of uh, respiratory violence is at about 20.4, uh, with a confidence interval of 17.7 17 to 23.3. But if you look at the proportions, this was quite similar for both TB patients and controls in terms of the proportion of individuals with any respiratory virus detected. But if you look at top three, these were common for both controls and uh, controls and, uh, and, and TB patients. They, okay, of course, the, 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 the commonest was uh, human rhinovirus with 8.6% uh, for TB patients, and for controls, it's about 10.5%. So we tried to look at if there is uh, sort of some sort of a seasonality. There is only a bump at, uh, between September and October, and also a small one uh, in March, April, uh, the topmost is the antivirus detected, and uh, similarly the other top three, rhinovirus, influenza A, and RSV, they almost exhibited the same shape, uh, uh, peaking in September, October, and March and April. So when we wanted to look at the risk factors for detecting any violence, uh, as of course you'd seen TB patients and controls, they had that similar proportions. But I'd like to, uh, of interest is uh, uh, people who smoked were likely to have um, uh, respiratory viruses, but also in households that have more than three people living in the same household. Of course, uh, the overcrowding in our, in our definition was purely pragmatic looking at the distribution of number of people in the same household. Of course, it's uh, some borderline significance. <clears throat> when we looked at now for TB patients, if these respiratory viruses could actually impact on the clinical phenotypes, we used the TB score that was uh, uh, proposed by Wetze and was published in 2008, which is 13 parameters. And what we did actually, we had a binary outcome, so severe TB score or a mild TB score, and we did a, a logistic regression uh, whereby we looked at any virus. If you see any virus, do this patient have a different clinical phenotypes compared to those, so between severe and mild? And uh, with any virus, of course, with some borderline significance, but the odds about the odds ratio was about 1.52. Of course, the confidence interval crosses the no effect line of one. Uh, smoking also had a borderline significance, but it, it just points out that viruses could actually have an impact on the, on the clinical presentation of TB patients. And um, when we looked at the radiological findings of the TB patients, of course, we did the logistic regression. I'd like also to point out that with any virus uh, detected, they seem to be suggestive that it, the viruses have an impact on, in terms of lung inflammation. And this is sort of, uh, is in line with what is, uh, was published in the mice models where mice with influenza virus had sort of a, a more lung uh, inflammation. So in conclusion, we, 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 we found that the, the prevalence or the proportions are the same. And this is kind of a similar to the, to the study done in Indonesia. But in, in, in the Indonesian study, they actually looked also the, 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 the IgG and the IgM. And although the proportions were similar, but it seems that TB patients had, 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 had an indication that they had a recent infection of virus. And that could be potentially uh, suggest that uh, maybe viruses play a role in terms of increasing the risk of developing TB. And of course, smoking and overcrowding were likely to, uh, to be associated with isolation of respiratory viral pathogens. And as I've said, the respiratory viruses could have an effect on the clinical presentation and then the radiological findings as I presented. I'd like to thank my institute, IHI, my uh, Swiss TPH where I do my PhD. I get funding from uh, the Canton of Basel and Rudolf Geige Foundation, but I also like to thank the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene who paid my, 
uh, registration fee and accommodation and attending this conference. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes, Michelle. There's a mic coming. If you look at the rates of TB in Tanzania, yes. it, not just during your study, but just historically, yes. is there any evidence of seasonality? Um, uh, good question. So um, uh, I almost wanted to include it in my PhD, but my supervisor said, maybe after you defend, you might do this. So. <laughs> <laughs> So in any way, I've, um, I've already introduced the, the topic to our program manager who's also around. And what we are trying to do is actually to pull up um, uh, all the data from the country because we are using the electronic TB register. So we, we might as well pull this data and see if there is seasonality. And it might be an interesting topic because we are looking at, if we are looking at viruses and viruses tend to exhibit this seasonality. So, it might be an interesting thing to do, to look at seasonality of TB and try to tie it to the seasonality of, uh, of respiratory viruses. I think that uh, would be a cool assessment to do. But I will wait until maybe March next year. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> Other questions? OK, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We are moving on to the effect and risk factor control on TB in Taiwan. I will try to pronounce your first name, Shu Yu Wang. I'm sorry if I butchered it. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Zhi Hui Wang, and I'm from the Institute of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine, National Taiwan University. And the topic of my presentation is the effect of risk factor control on tuberculosis in Taiwan, a modeling study. And as you know, uh, TB incidence has declined over the past 10 years, but there are uh, many, still many people suffering from TB. And the goal of the NTB strategy is to end the uh, TB epidemic by 2035. And the indicators include the 95% uh, reduction in TB deaths and 90% reduction in TB incidence and zero families facing catastrophic cause due to TB. And however, uh, it is, will be hard to achieve the 90% reduction target with current pace of uh, decline trend in TB incidence. So uh, to accelerate the decline trend uh, in, addition, in addition to enhancing the case finding and the access to treatment, the NTV surgery also emphasized the importance of addressing determinants of TB and the comorbidities. And the TB determinants can be classified as Aptering determinants and approximate risk factors. And exposure to approximate risk factors would impair host defense and increase the risk of active disease. And some of risk factors are related to human lifestyle and uh, individual behavior, such as smoking, alcohol, and uh, diabetes. So it is necessary to know how these risk factors influence TB burden. And some studies have used a dynamic model to evaluate the effect of single risk factor on TB. Uh, but the result cannot uh, be compared due to different settings and uh, different model assumptions. And also there are correlations between these risk factors. So uh, uh, the, the effect of the multiple risk factors should be included in the model. And a few studies have assessed the impact of reducing multiple risk factors on future trend of TB incidence. And a few researchers have done this kind of study at national level. So the aim of this study is to use a dynamic model to evaluate the effect of risk factor on TB in Taiwan. And we use a compartmental model to simulate the TB epidemics. And the populations were uh, divided into these uh, compartments uh, based on TB natural history. And each compartment were further divided into 20 age strata. Because in Taiwan, uh, TB incidence vary, varies widely in different age groups. So with this uh, age strata, we use an uh, age specific R to uh, adjust the parameters and uh, replicate the age pattern in Taiwan. 
and the model was uh, calibrated to the observed TB incidence trend in Taiwan and by adjusting the transmission parameter and the duration of infectiousness. And we chose smoking, alcohol, diabetes, and underweight to evaluate their effect. And based on previous studies and meta analysis, these risk factors are related to uh, active disease by increasing the risk of infection or the risk of progression. And uh, also, these risk factors are related to the treatment outcome. So we use the prevalence and the relative risk of these risk factors to adjust uh, the parameters. And the data of prevalence and the relative risk of active TB uh, was from Taiwan National Health Interview Survey. And the NHIS is a cross-sectional survey with uh, nationally representative samples. And the health information was co collected by in-person interview. And so we calculated the joint prevalence and uh, used the three years data to project in the current trends of these risk factors. And the prevalence was also stratified by age. And the NHS data can cross match to TB and the death registry. So we uh, estimate the relative risk and uh, for single risk factor, and the land use and additive excess risk model to estimate the joint RR. And for the uh, relative risk for relapse rate and the death rate was uh, obtained from previous studies. So these are the uh, estimated trend of these four risk factors. And the smoking is uh, decreasing, and the alcohol will not be changed a lot, and diabetes will large rising, and the underweight is uh, also decreasing. And the uh, brown points are the um, uh, NHS data. So if uh, these four risk factors follow the current trend and the, the uh, other TB-specific interventions remains the same, uh, the projected TB incidence would uh, be reduced 12% by 2035. And the slowdown of the uh, uh, TB, reduction, uh, TB incidence reductions may be due to the population aging and the rising of diabetes. And then we set the scenarios for risk factor control except for smoking, uh, because the smoking rate uh, has already declined and the goal of uh, the having smoking rate uh, in 10 years in Taiwan can be reached uh, if following the current trend. And uh, for alcohol use, uh, the scenarios were set according to WHO NCD targets, that is 10% reduction uh, by 2020 compared to 2010, and then keeping the, uh, keep this trend until 2035. And for diabetes, the uh, uh, scenarios was also uh, set according to WHO NCD control targets, and uh, uh, diabetes prevalence would stop rising after 2015. And for underweight, uh, we uh, set the scenarios according to SDG Go2 and hunger. The uh, prevalence of underweight would reduce to zero by 2030. And we also set a scenario that uh, these three control targets are uh, achieved simultaneously. And these are the results. So you can see uh, even uh, we uh, achieve the, uh, control, all these three control targets, the uh, TB incidence will not be uh, reduced very large. And uh, among the uh, three scenarios of single risk factor control, uh, stopping the rising of diabetes have the greatest impact on TB incidence. And we also curious about uh, what is the maximum effect of uh, the risk factor control. So we set an optimal scenario that uh, all risk factors uh, reduce to zero by 2030. So if all uh, risk factors reduce to zero, uh, the uh, projected TB incidence would reduce uh, 36% by 2035. And the estimated TB incidence will still larger than the uh, target, uh, 10 cases per 100,000. So um, in discussion, uh, this is, uh, to our knowledge, this is a uh, uh, first national assessment of impact of uh, NCD risk factors on TB control. And in the uh, SDG era, uh, our uh, study can provide quantitative data for the effect of the linkage between different uh, uh, health sec sectors. And our research shows that uh, the impact of risk factor control is moderate. So um, risk, factor risk factor control only may not be sufficient to uh, achieve uh, the target of ending TB. 
and uh, among the uh, scenarios of uh, single reject control, uh, we found that uh, we found a larger impact of diabetes uh, prevention. Uh, because in the diabetes prevalence is la uh, rising rapidly in uh, Taiwan, especially in the elderly. And uh, also in Taiwan, the TB incidence is uh, relatively high in uh, people older than 65 years old. So uh, the effect of diabetes uh, prevention would be more effective than the other two scenarios. And uh, uh, we also have some limitation. The results will be uh, influenced by the parameter we used in the model. And although we have uh, considered the uncertainty of these parameters, but uh, the real uh, values of these parameter may not the same as our estimation. And uh, we also do a, a variable uncertainty analysis, and the result is unchanged that uh, the ranking of the importance of these risk factors are the same and uh, also the impact of risk factor is uh, moderate. So um, for the uh, countries with um, median burden like uh, Taiwan, uh, it will be harder to reduce TB burden uh, than in the high TB burden countries, so the combination of all uh, risk fact, uh, the combination of all uh, all kind of uh, TB interventions will be needed to achieve the uh, NTB target. So for the next step, uh, the effect of uh, upstream determinants and the effect of TB specific interventions should be included into the model so that we can know. Uh, we can know uh, how these uh, interventions work together to help us to reduce the TB burden. And uh, I would like to thank uh, my advisor, Xin Ho Lin, and, uh, and other members from National Taiwan University, and Dr. Wang, Dr. Jiang, and this uh, uh, study was supported by National Health Research Institute. Thank you. I have a question. Um, uh, so when you uh, modeled the, um, all the risk factors together, did you assume that there's any joint distribution, that's, that some people had multiple risk factors? Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, because we have four risk factors in our model, so there, and each uh, risk factor was classified uh, was binary exposure, so there were 60 combinations of the yeah, these uh, exposures. So we uh, calculate uh, the, the prevalence of these 60 combinations. Any other questions? Great, thank you. And leaving us a little bit depressed, I think, after <laughs> looking at the NTB options. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Our next speaker is D. Grint, I, yes, going to speak about diabetes among those newly diagnosed with pulmonary TB. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, so I'm Daniel Grint from St. George's University of London. We know from the literature that um, people with diabetes are approximately three times as likely to get TB. This is among a background increasing burden of diabetes worldwide. The WHO predicts or well, estimates that by 2040, one in 10 adults will have diabetes. We also know that three quarters of people with diabetes now live in lower and middle income settings where TB is often endemic. And importantly, almost half of these adults are unaware of their diabetic status. This led to a joint call to action from the union and WHO to, um, to the, which suggests that t TB and diabetes is a looming co-epidemic and they mentioned that diabetes could be fueling the spread of TB. Now, the Tandem Consortium is a multidisciplinary team of clinicians and epidemiologists, and we have collaborating centers in Indonesia, Romania, Peru, and South Africa. If any of you were in the TB diabetes session yesterday, you would have seen Rana Van Cravel gave an ex excellent overview of the Tandem study. Um, suffice to say here, I will just briefly say that the aims of the study are to improve knowledge of the link between TB and diabetes and to impact uh, on control of TB and diabetes comorbidity. And one of the ways we wish to do this is by improving screening and management of diabetes among TB patients. <clears throat> 
The aims of this study then were to identify the most accurate markers of diabetes among those newly diagnosed with pulmonary TB. And of particular interest was whether cheap diagnostic risk scores could be considered a viable alternative to expensive blood testing and whether we can reduce the need for expensive point of care tests. So to do this, we have a cohort of newly diagnosed pulmonary TB patients uh, with no previous diabetes diagnosis. Those patients are excluded from this analysis. Among these individuals, we've collected data on HbA1c, random plasma glucose, fasting blood glucose, and a host of other anthropometric measurements. And throughout, we consistently define new diabetes using gold standard laboratory HbA1c, using the standard cut point of 6.5%. Um, this gold standard was attained using a step one accredited laboratory, and in all cases, this was not the local lab. <coughs> The diagnostic accuracy of the other diabetes markers was then assessed using area under the rock curve and sensitivity and specificity. We considered three uh, currently published diabetes risk scores that are listed here. And we, <clears throat> we chose these based on a recent review of the subject which suggested they are the highest diagnostic performance in validation studies. We also developed two further tandem risk scores, which aimed to maximize diagnostic accuracy by combining uh, blood testing with anthropometric measures. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about how these scores were derived, except just to show the components that are included here. Okay, so we have a cohort of just under 2,000 newly diagnosed pulmonary TB patients. Among these individuals, we found 114 new diabetes cases. That's a prevalence of around 6%, but remember this is excluding previously diagnosed diabetes. In general, data were mostly complete on anthropometric measurements, although there was some difficulty in obtaining fasting blood glucose, particularly in South Africa and Indonesia. Looking at the overall diagnostic accuracy of these markers then, the highest areas on the rock curve were seen for the two tandem scores and point of care HbA1c testing followed by random plasma glucose, whereas the, for the three published risk scores, the area under the rock curves were all fairly similar but somewhat lower than the other markers. In terms of sensitivity and specificity, again, the tandem risk scores and the point of care HbA1c test had the highest combinations, but we also considered a two-step um, two combination of random plasma glucose and point of care HbA1c. In this potentially cost-saving combination, everyone is tested with random plasma glucose. Anyone with uh, a result above 11.1 millimole per litre is considered to have diabetes and is not, no further testing is done. People with um, greater than 6.1 millimole per litre is, are then tested with point of care HbA1c at the two cut points suggested here. And what we found is that this combination had equal, um, equally good um, diagnostic accuracy as, as point of care HbA1c alone, but it reduced the need for this expensive test by 70%. Looking at these data overall only shows part of the story. When we looked at the distribution of HbA1c in each of the different countries, we found that in Indonesia and Peru, these new cases of diabetes tended to have very high levels of HbA1c, with a median of around 10%. Whereas in Romania and South Africa, there was a very large group of people who had only just crossed the diabetes threshold. You see these large um, bars here for between 6.5 and 7% HbA1c. <clears throat> so we, we stratified the diagnostic accuracy um, analysis by country. And as you might expect, in the countries where diabetes was found to be severe, all of the diagnostic markers performed very well, particularly the two-step process you can see in Indonesia there. Whereas in Romania and South Africa, where most of the diabetes cases had just crossed the threshold, actually none of the markers performed very well. You can see sensitivities in South Africa from 11% going up to 50% in Romania at best. Okay, so to summarize then, um, these simple point of care methods for screening di uh, for diabetes seem to have good diagnostic accuracy overall. In particular, the two-step process of using random plasma glucose and point of care HbA1c seems to offer good diagnostic accuracy while reducing the need for expensive point of care HbA1c testing. 
However, it's quite obvious there is no one-size-fits-all approach here, and the diagnostic accuracy depends wholly on the severity of diabetes in the population. And an interesting question this really brings up is, in these individuals with pulmonary TB, is HbA1c between 6.5 and 7%, have they really got diabetes? It's possible that these individuals have got pre-diabetes, and as a result of transient hyperglycemia due to TB, they've just crossed over the threshold into diabetes. And given um, a, treat a course of TB therapy, they could well revert back to pre-diabetes. However, much like gestational diabetes, these individuals are probably very likely to progress to diabetes in the future. Okay, in the interest of time, I'll finish here and just say thank you to the tandem collaborators and thank you for listening. Questions? Okay, if there's no questions, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, I, I think, is here, um, Ahmed. Anybody from um, the Rapid Assessment of Nutritional Status Group? Okay, I think that we'll move on then. So um, uh, the last speaker then is Ms. Pineda from uh, um, Socios en Salud. I'm sorry. Are you, Segundo, are you, are you presenting? Okay. It's Segundo Leon from Socios en Salud. Hello everyone. So we're moving to um, like a more boring topic, alcohol. So I'm presenting on behalf of Cynthia Pinedo, who made this abstract um, using some uh, data from a clinical trial that we had uh, in Peru in the last couple of years, um, entitled uh, Alcohol and Substance Use Among Participants in a Clinical Trial Receiving Home-Based DO2 Treatment for um, Tuberculosis. So, um, so general information we know, but this is not only true for TB, but for any other infectious disease uh, uh, or any other uh, disease, um, alcohol might contribute to a poor adherence to treatment um, and also uh, poor treatment outcomes in, in, in patients. So it's very common to, to have uh, patients that use alcohol or any other substances uh, being excluded from participating in clinical trials is part of the uh, exclusion criteria. I mean, you, you consume or use alcohol or use any other substance, immediately they will say you are not able to participate in a clinical trial. So even that those patients sometimes are assumed to be high risk um, despite uh, being a very important epidemiological uh, subgroup, especially for uh, TB control in this case. So we think that um, if, if we implement appropriate follow-up strategies uh, and support to these participants, probably it's possible to um, include those participants in studies or clinical trials. So what we did was um, a sub-analysis of uh, data from a double-blind randomized uh, placebo-controlled high-dose Rifampin clinical trial, which is called High Rif, that was implemented in Lima between 2013 and 2015. Um, inclusion criteria uh, for uh, participating in the study included uh, being a smear positive, uh, drug susceptible for tuberculosis, and receiving uh, community uh, based DOT. And the participants were follow up for uh, the course of one year. We identify in, in the analysis those participants that self report alcohol and substance use, that we all call ASU now, um, through an uh, interview uh, made by physicians at, at, at the clinical site where we implemented the study. And based on the response they provided, we classify the, the participants in two different groups. 
ever consume alcohol or any substance or never consume alcohol or any substance. Um, and we implemented some support, you know, in increasing some effort to track the participants and ensure retention and treatment completion. We're trying to do it equally in both, uh, in both rules. So part of the tracking methods that we use were based on, on phone calls to, to the participants, some additional visits that were required based on the need for uh, completing the treatment, and we track the participants using different strategies that you can see in the, in the slide. And from the data we collected, we calculated um, as, at least three outcomes. So the first outcome was the, the, the number of the days to treatment completion. Uh, basically, the day when they complete the 110 doses that uh, was required for complete the study, the number of unscheduled visits per patient, and also the number of early terminations. So, and we compare at the end um, the alcohol and substance users to non-users using chi-square tests for um, the indicators I just mentioned. So this is all the results, very uh, small result. So I'm on the 180 participants. So almost 50% cell report any ASU at baseline. Um, one of the important things that we, we can show you in this table is that, uh, and it's very significant, is the number of unscheduled visits per patient. So we had um, more unscheduled visits per patient in the group of, pe of people or participants that ever report any uh, ASU. So there were uh, some limitations that are not uh, in the slides, but I have to mention that um, we didn't collect the specific data about alcohol use. That's one of the main limitations. So probably you are thinking in audit or cage information. I mean, using um, audit probably is one of the best ways to collect information about alcohol use. And we didn't collect information about some additional social factor that could condition the use of alcohol and substance among those participants and how um, the psychosocial effects of, do, of the alcohol could affect probably their uh, willingness to complete or to adhere, to, to, adhere to, to treatments. But so far we can conclude that uh, in this clinical trial at least a half of them uh, reported or self-reported alcohol uh, or substance use. Um, definitely participants who use substances required more resources, more effort for retention, um, but at the end they could complete the study. Uh, there were no differences in the time to treatment completion or the number of early terminations between the two groups. Um, one of the things we learned is that um, for the case of these participants in clinical trials, so there we should use multiple approaches including developing relationships with participants through our field teams or um, strengthening the relationship between the participants and their families and friends, or through social networks uh, to uh, increase the force to recruit and retain those participants in the studies uh, that we conducted, especially when we have uh, like a high burden of uh, alcohol and substance consumption among uh, the population. So that's it, thank you. Questions? Hello. <laughs> Questions? Hi, I'm Anime Sana from MSF. I'm working in Belarus. Um, no question, but a comment uh, regarding your presentation. I think it's a very important finding, especially in the context of patients who have extensively drug resistant or MDR TB and who could benefit from the new drugs. We see in many countries that we work in that physicians are reluctant on putting these patients on new drug on the fear that, oh, these patients probably would not complete their treatment and they would gain additional resistance to the new drugs. So your study uh, shows that we need extra resources. We need to invest more in these patients, but then they do complete the uh, study. And similar, another similar study which was done by Partners in Health in Tomsk also uh, the uh, Sputnik program also demonstrated equal effectiveness that these patients will be able to complete their treatment if enough resources are put in. So I think it's, uh, it's a very important study. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Thank you, Sigwinda, for your um, excellent presentation. I just wonder, um, I guess we know that patients in clinical trials tend to do you know, better than patients in real life, and I just wonder if there's any way of um, you know, collecting any data on a similar matched population from this area that were not involved in the clinical trial but identified as using alcohol. I think that's one of the assessments that's routinely made in the, in the Centos de Salud. Um, that might be interesting if that data was available. Yeah. So um, I have to say that I just moved from the HIV world to the TB world since a year ago. So that I have no much experience with alcohol and tuberculosis, but uh, one of the things I learned in the HIV war um, is related to what you, to your comment is that there are several, um, not several, but at least two or three publications that, um, that came from Peruvian data that they use data from health centers for trying to um, retain and treat people with HIV uh, for other diseases like syphilis, um, or other STIs. Um, actually, they did well. They show in some results published by Herrera this year that um, some patients could benefit at the clinics when they receive additional support from the health center, calls, letters, um, visits by nurses or technicians. Um, at the end, uh, the, the, the outcome of cure, for example, for syphilis was higher than the common uh, or regular um, uh, delivery of health service in the, in the health centers. Um, you, you used the term social networks, and I was wondering if you meant that in sort of a traditional sense, or did you use any sort of uh, newer technologies to reach out to this population or to engage them? Um, so that's one question. And the second question is, is it likely that the findings of your study might be incorporated into sort of uh, the larger TB control program strategies in terms of um, either increasing um, retention or completion of therapy for what some people believe is a hard to reach group? Interesting question. So we didn't use any technology to create social networks. So um, basically the, the, the social network we create is fierce through the, our field team. Our field team is very close to the population. That's one of the strengths of our work. Um, but also our field team is very close to the health services. So we are kind of the link between the population and the, and the services. So this is part of the social network we are creating in, in Lima. Um, regarding to your second question, I think, I mean, this is just uh, um, a very small analysis. I think we should do more. Uh, probably uh, what I, got, I would suggest is to include more data on alcohol and substance use using like a more regulated uh, way to collect the data using probably audit or cage. That would be the first decision. The second one is probably to include a larger population um, in probably not within the study, probably within the services. So working in the real, in the real world probably will give us a better results, or a better approach at the end. I would like to open it up to questions to, for any of the presenters, if, if, especially since Michelle, we didn't get a chance to ask the first presenter questions due to the time limitations. I, had, I just had one sort of question, comment about the high prevalence of, in, in your, sorry, and thank you very much. If uh, anyone you. else has any other questions for him. The high rate of mental illness. It was 20% in, in, in the cohort, right? Is that the norm for non-diabetic TB? Is it, is it equivalent to the population mental illness? I don't actually know, but we do know that um, there is a high prevalence of mental illness among the, uh, the TB population, mm -hmm. either you know, all the things that might go along with homelessness, um, which is a, is a risk factor. Um, but yeah, it was 
twenty percent. Twenty percent in both in both groups. Yeah. So. Thanks. Uh, we did uh, a few years ago a, a study uh, in a cohort of TB patients in Lima, and we found around thirty percent at the beginning of the TB treatment uh, have a, a score compa uh, compatible with uh, a major depression episode. So, and was related with uh, poor treatment outcomes at the end of the treatment in sensitive TB. So yes, probably the we uh, mental health is also a, a point that probably we are not focused. Mm -hmm. That's well. amazing. That's only with the diagnosis of major depression not, and not taking into consideration potential other diagnoses, and it's still 30 percent. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're, if there's no other comments, or dialogue, or questions, we are going to close this session 10 minutes early. Thank you, and have a lovely evening.